Have a seat. Thank you, team. Uh, great job. As I said, we're going to kind of change things up a little bit sometimes, because I, I don't know about you, but there's times when changing things helps you understand why you do them in the first place. And so we're going we're gonna to continue. We're going to have some more singing. I, I'm, I'm excited uh, for the end of the service, because they're going to come, the team's going to come back. We're going to sing a few more songs. Uh, but we're going to do something this morning that uh, from time to time we need to do. We need to look at why it is that we do what we do. And, and I want to begin just by reminding you again what, what I shared last week, that God's Word is something that I absolutely love with all my heart. Uh, it's my authority. Uh, it's my teacher. It's my friend. Uh, God's Word is really, for me, the one thing in my life that I can say has never failed me. It's never fallen short. I've come up short with it. I've failed it. But God's word has never failed me. And, and, that's, and that's who I live. I don't have it all figured out. Please, please don't hear that. I, I don't have it all figured out. I'm, a, I'm still a student when it comes to God's word. Um, but I want you to know that in this church, um, as long as I'm the pastor, we're going to look to this for our authority. And this is going to be our source of that authority. So um, I want to just share with you something, a couple quotes this week that I found as I was researching a little bit. And one was from a guy named Billy Graham. You've probably heard of Billy Graham. Uh, had a mildly successful ministry a few years back. Uh, <laughs> some of you don't know Billy Graham. Uh, he, was, he was probably one of the people uh, in this last century uh, that took the gospel into a, what we would call a modern era. I mean, he really did things that no one else had done um, in hundreds of years. Uh, but this is what he said of the Bible. He said, the very practice of reading the Bible will have a purifying effect upon your mind and heart. Let nothing take the place of this daily exercise. Getting into God's word will be good, will be good for you, and it will be good for you. It's an incredible exercise. Dwight L. Moody said this. He said, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. You see, God's word isn't meant to inform us alone. It's meant to transform us. And, and I don't know about you, but there's a lot of parts in me that need to be changed, that need to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Is there anybody with me that would agree? I, I haven't arrived yet. And, and I know that many of you are on that journey as well. And so what I want to do uh, this morning, we're going we're to look at a passage of Scripture out of the book of Psalms. And this passage of Scripture, more than anyone, I believe, paints a picture. It gives a vision of what can happen when God's Word and God's church becomes your source. It becomes that place where you go. And it's Psalms chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, it's going to be right in the, in the middle of your, of your Scriptures. Uh, Psalms is 150 uh, songs and poems that were written by David and others. Uh, but this one is particularly familiar uh, but I want you to just uh, listen as we read this together. The words will be on the screen as well. Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They, the wicked, are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. I, I want you to catch a little phrase that's prevalent in that verse, and it's the way. The way. What way are we going to go? There's a way of the wicked, and there's a way of the righteous. In Proverbs, it tells us parents were to raise up our children, what, in the way that they should go. So, so this image of a way, a direction we should go is really important. And as the church, it's important for us from time to time to come back and re-examine 
our GPS. How many of you have ever been on a trip and the, and the GPS got off? Okay. <laughs> and it's telling you to take turns that you don't need to take. Uh, you end up in a place that you didn't want to be. It, it's important that we recalibrate. And so from time to time, regular intervals in our church, we, we come back to what's most important. We calibrate our purpose or our reason for existence. Another way of saying that, our way of being. You see, it's more than just a set of organizational principles in sermons and in songs. It's actually a lifestyle that we're called to. Jesus didn't call us to give a certain amount of time on a certain day of the week to honor him. He's actually called us to a completely different lifestyle. And so as the church, we need to come back to this, and we're going to be doing that uh, this morning as we begin this series called King Jesus. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and do a little drawing, if you guys will humor me. Um, I, it, it, I, you know, you can talk back, okay, if you like something. I mean, I, at the first service, I, I did really good, so I'm, I'm hoping that my art can be as impactful as it was at the first service. Um, but there's really three things that we have to be about, three lifestyle choices that we have to make if we're going to be the church, if we're going to be on the way of the righteous. And the three things, um, they all come out of commands that Jesus gave when he was on earth. And the first one is this. It's simply to love God. We, we call that worship. Magnification, lifting up the name of Jesus. Our lives need to be a worship to our God. Loving God is our function. It's our purpose as human beings. God created us to worship him. And one day he's going to gather all of the nations, all of the people, red and yellow, black and white, everyone from all corners of the earth to worship him for eternity. And so what we're doing when we come together and we sing songs, we're not just kind of singing some songs to kind of get through the first part of the service. Okay? We're not, it's not about entertainment. It's about practicing for our eternal occupation which will be singing praise to our God and creator. Okay? So loving God is a big deal. It's a huge deal. Now, it begins not just, it's not just about here, it's about our whole week. And so what I'm doing uh, this week, is just laid on my heart, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to invite you to be a part of this. We always say church begins when you leave, not when you come. But I'm going to encourage you, tomorrow is April 1st, or Fool's, April Fool's Day, and this is no joke. What I'm going to encourage our church to do is to consider going on a 21-day fast from April 1st to April 21st, which is Easter Sunday, okay? And here's the purpose of it. It's not to get healthier or to lose some weight, although I could use that. And the thing that I'm choosing to fast from is actually a particular food. Um, the donut thing's going good, by the way. Um, it's really going good. I had one slip up on accident. But uh, I'm, I've chosen something. It was an accident. It wasn't even my fault. Um, it was my wife's fault. Um, where is she? she? Okay, anyway. Um, but here's, here's what I want to encourage you. Consider something. It, it might be something related to your, to your social media. It might be something related to a relationship. It might be something related to uh, a, maybe a, a program that you watch on TV or a personal discipline. Fasting is simply taking one thing and putting it off to the side, putting the pause button on it, and intentionally for a time, and devoting that time that you'd normally spend maybe on Facebook or eating, in my case, and devoting it to prayer and to the reading of God's Word. It doesn't have to be something elaborate. It just has to be something that you offer to God as a sacrifice of praise. Now, I'm excited for you. I, I'm not going to be checking up on you, but I think it'd be cool as a church if we could do that for 21 days. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to be launching another little uh, corporate initiative, I guess you could say. We're going to be doing uh, a reading plan together. Uh, we're going to be doing a 14-day reading plan leading up to the 14 days. So from Monday, April 8th to Sunday, April 21st, Easter Sunday, we're going to do the last 14 days of the life of Christ leading up to his crucifixion. We're going to be looking at God's word all together, all on the same page throughout those 14 days. And so uh, we won't start that until next Monday, 
But if you don't have the YouVersion Bible app, I really want to encourage you to download that on your phone so we can do that together as a church and we can read the word together. And then April 21st, we're talking about worship now, loving God. We're going to gather together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so uh, in order for us to accommodate all of the people, we're going to have an extra service. We'll have a service at 7.30 a.m. We'll have one at 9 and one at 11. And so really want to encourage you uh, to be a part of that. Um, so that's the first one, love God. That's, that's worship. Okay? We do that corporately on a Sunday morning. We also do that privately, individual worship. And so we're really going to try to highlight that over the next three weeks. Um, here's, here's the second purpose, the second reason that we exist as a church. And that's to love people. Loving God, loving people. Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus said, oh, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. See, he he turned the question on purpose because he was making a point. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's celebrate we love God and we love people. That's what we call ministry. Last week, I encourage you to, to think about somebody who doesn't have a church home, who doesn't have a relationship maybe with Christ, to begin to pray for them, to, to begin to ask God to open up a door where you could speak into their life. And then I ask you to consider talking with them, maybe just have a conversation with them, prayerfully asking them maybe what their plans are to celebrate Easter. And, and then thirdly, to, to go ahead and invite them and come, have them come with you uh, to church, have them join you to celebrate uh, really the Super Bowl Sunday of our church. So that's people. That's about loving people. Um, I have a, friend, a friend of mine that um, recently invited him to come to church. He hasn't come yet, but guess what? I'm going to keep inviting him. I'm going to keep praying for him. I'm going to keep talking to him because I believe that God wants to do something in his life. So loving God, loving people. Uh, here, here's something else I need you to know about loving people. Uh, at Celebrate, we're about relationships, we're about people, um, uh, especially little people, okay? And, and over the last several months, we've had a, uh, what I would call an explosion of little people, <laughs> okay? Um, most churches uh, our size, in a community our size, 18 to 20% of their total attendance is birth through uh, elementary school, 18 to 20%. Well, our percentage uh, over the last year is pushing 35%, Okay? So when this building was built, it wasn't necessary. We, we knew it was going to be probably 25 to 28%, but we're, we've been really, really blessed to see the number of young kids that are coming, families that are coming and bringing their kids. Um, two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, when we had our, our Daylight Savings Sunday, which is typically a service that you know, people kind of sleep in that week for some reason, we had 33 kids just in our preschool area. And, and there's some folks here that serve in preschool, um, Go ahead, raise your hands. Those of you that serve in the nursery and preschool, go ahead and raise your hands. Go, oh, come on, raise them, raise them up. Thank for these for these folks. Uh, it gets a little tight in there, <laughs> and so God's God's blessed us. Um, the leadership of the church, uh, we we got together, we talked about this issue, and they said, "Well, I got an idea, John. Let's kick you out of your office." So I no longer have an office in the church anymore. That's going to be our new nursery. Okay. And so we've got people in the church that are working on that. They've already got the, the carpet laid, or they're getting the carpet laid, they've got the wall cut, and we're going to expand our nursery. So the current nursery and preschool is going to expand so that we can accommodate all of our little folks and all of our big folks that are helping <laughs> because we really need more space. And we believe that's where God's leading us to reaching the next generation. So um, obviously I want to encourage you, as we're loving people in our community, that's, that's a need. You can be praying for that. Um, a way that you can participate. Not everybody's wired to serve in children's ministry. Many of you here know what I'm talking about. You're like, I can't do that. Okay, well, in order to do things, in order to help reach people, it takes money. It takes resources. So if you're a person that's part of our church, um, many of you do this, and we're thankful for that, you can, you can, you can return to the church. A tithe, the 10% is what the Bible talks about, of what God's given to you. Returning a portion of that for the ministry of his church. And so I want to encourage you, that's a way you can worship and simultaneously love and care for people. 
So it's a really great thing. I'd consider, ask you to consider that. Um, if you're a guest here, of course, you're, you're, you're welcome to be here. It's not something that you have to do. I'm just, I'm just trying to do that because I know when you put God first in your finances, everything else comes into order. However, if God's not first in every area of your life, including your finances, everything becomes out of order. So putting him first, setting aside that 10% is huge because it's worship. It's honoring God. It's also, as part of the church, allows us to love people. Um, some of you probably know this already, but this year alone, we've given, um, I, guess I don't have the exact number, it's around, since May 1st of last year, it's around $18,000 that you have given to immediate local needs and global needs. Uh, just two weeks ago, you can, you can clap for that, that's good. <clears throat> because of everything that comes in, the first 10% in this church is set aside to give to local and immediate needs. And uh, we, we believe that this community has needs, and I believe because we're committed to that, that those needs come to us. Just, just two weeks ago, we had a gal um, who had a, a, had a, had a uh, flood in her basement. Um, doesn't have the resources, capacity to clean it up, and so we were able to help her clean that up and pay for the, the cleanup. Yesterday, a, a group of men from the church were able to go over and help her move a few of the larger items out of the basement and help her just get back on her feet. That's what the church does. Okay, that's loving people. And that's what you get to be a part of. Here's the other thing that I want you to consider. Maybe you are a person, you say, you know, I, I do love working with kids. I love being a part of that. We would encourage you. You have a little card on your chair. Go ahead and fill that out. Just put your name, your contact information, and write kids on there. We'd love to connect you in our children's ministry to help meet the needs and teach those kids about Jesus. Here, here's the myth. People think that, um, that my job is the hardest job. It's not. Because I'm babysitting adults, and you guys, for the most part, are pretty compliant. <laughs> I'm babysitting you, okay? The real work of God that he's doing in this church happens on the other side of the wall in the nursery, the preschool and the elementary. Because those are the hearts that are genuinely soft and genuinely are learning things. And not that you guys aren't, but as you grow older, there's a tendency to put the walls up, correct? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are putting your walls up right now. <laughs> but the most important ministry in our church is our children's ministry. And so if, if, you have a, if you have a capacity or a passion or a desire to serve, fill out one of these cards, fill out one of these. We'd love to get you connected, get you plugged in serving. Uh, and many of you are, are doing that. Um, love God, love people. Is everybody with me so far? I said this at the first service, by the way, too. And, and don't, don't, uh, don't wait for me or someone to tell you what to do. Listen to God. Ask him, God, what can I do? This week, I don't know what it means, but I drove past McCarty Park and I, someone said, that's a mess. And I began to think about, how is that going to get cleaned up? And the thought occurred to me, I don't have a plan, I don't have anything like this, but what if the church or churches in our community could come together and help clean that up? Because it's kind of a mess. What if we could do that? Now, I don't, I don't know what that means, but it just occurred to me. What's God telling you? What's occurred to you? about how you could love people in your community. You see, if you're open to it, God's going to give you those ideas. He's going to give you those urgings and promptings. And maybe it's something you could do. Okay? So love God, love people. Here's the next one. Okay? Make disciples. There's two kinds of people uh, in our world. There's takers and there's makers. I mean, there's folks in our world, you, you probably know folks like this, their, their goal is to sit back, watch the world go by, and take it in as it goes. They're just, maybe just, you know, just take it. There's takers. And, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that because I do believe that the key to growing in Christ is you have to take and you have to receive from him. It's very important. It's why we tell people in our church when you start serving, you need to attend one so that you can receive and then you need to serve one so that you can give. Okay, there's a balance to that. We have to receive. But there seems to be a couple of mindsets, one being this idea of taking it all. It's, it's, it's this idea of collecting, 
gathering knowledge and information, accumulating wealth and possessions, consuming, experiencing. It seems to be a a mantra for many people in our world today. But Jesus didn't tell us to go and take. Jesus said that we are to go and make. In Matthew 28, Jesus did not say go and take pictures with all the nations or go and experience all the world has to offer. He didn't even say go and follow your passions or go and follow your dreams. What did Jesus say in Matthew 28? He said go and make disciples of all nations, of all people. When you really sit on that for a minute, it's pretty overwhelming. You see, Jesus is saying you're to go and make disciples. You're to make it happen. What's the number one way for us to do this, to make disciples? It's through through life groups. Last year at this time, we had six life groups. This year, we have 13 life groups in our meeting. Here's the reality. We need about twice that many. (laughs) Plus, my goal is that we'd have 30 by the end of the year. But we need people that are willing to say, hey, I'll host a life group. I've got two friends that I could invite over and we could have a life group. That's really all it is. Okay? Beginning to grow in community. That's what a life group is. On Sundays, we gather and then we scatter. We've talked about this. We huddle up and then we hustle out into the world. Everything that you need cannot be provided here on a Sunday morning. For you to make disciples of all nations, you have to first make a disciple of yourself. And a disciple is someone who's committed to learning and growing. A disciple is someone who's saying, you know what, i got to get this book, not into my life, but I have to get my life into this book. A disciple is someone who learns of Jesus. I want to share something with you that might be surprising to you. It was shocking to me when I heard this. But did you know that 70% of all new retail spaces, in other words, 70% of all new retail buildings that have been built in the United States since 2016. Okay, so you got the picture? Two years, or three years, 70% of all new retail space has gone to one retail chain. It's the number one grossing retail chain in our country. Would anybody like to take a guess the name of that retail chain? Close. Same concept different generation. Dollar General. Dollar General has 70% of new retail space belongs to Dollar General since 2016. It's crazy. Number one retailer of all time. And, And here's the reality. Dollar General has realized the need and they're going to meet it. They're, they're, they're approaching communities like Brandon, Garretson, and they're saying, you know what, there's a need, and we're going to fill it. We're going to do everything we can. And what I love about Dollar General, I've been doing a little bit of study about them. In their hiring process, do you know what the number one thing is that they look for in an employee? <laughs> no. It's not a smile, it's not customer service. The number one thing they look for is someone who walks quickly wherever they go. They won't hire somebody that walks slow. That's their number one hire. They're looking for industriousness. And as I think about that, I think to myself, I wonder if that's what we're looking for in the church. See, see, we're a part of a kingdom, God's kingdom. Jesus is bringing a new kingdom. Are we hustling about the business? of building God's kingdom here on earth. Because if we understand that we're the body of Christ, do you think Jesus walked around like this? Or was he on mission? Was he focused? Did he hustle from place to place? I don't know, that, that's maybe a good theological question for many of us. You see, I believe Jesus lived his life on purpose. I believe that he was intentional. And this is where we're going to bring this together because if these things are going to work, if this is going to be our lifestyle as a church, if we're going to love God, if we're going to love people and make disciples, we can't do it on our own. You see, there's a gaping hole in the middle, and this is what it's going to require. This is the art part that I'm really excited about.
Is Jesus king? Is he your king? So you're not going to be able to love God, people, and make disciples. You won't be able to do that unless Jesus is king. It's another quote this week from the Bible that I, I found. It said this, The Bible isn't a storybook with many heroes. No, there's only one hero in Scripture. The Son, the Lamb, the Savior, the King, the Redeemer, Jesus. See, here's the reality. Jesus is king, and he will be king one day. When Jesus came the first time, many of his people didn't recognize him. And unfortunately, I think many people in this day, they don't live as though he's returning. But the reality is this. If we're going to be the church, we need to acknowledge that Jesus is king. And when he returns, he won't be waiting on election results. He's not waiting for our permission or our consent for him to take his kingdom. He is king. And the kingdom that he ushered in in the first century wasn't what they had expected. They had expected a political takeover. But the word of God gives us this picture of the king, Jesus. And in Zechariah chapter 9, these, this verse will be on the screen. Zechariah chapter 9, the prophet is painting a picture of what the kingdom of God is going to look like. And this is what he writes. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble. Riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. God speaking, now the prophet speaking through, or God speaking through the prophet, I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. Jesus is coming to set up a whole new political system. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations, to all the people. His realm will stretch from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Peace is not going to come through our political process. It's going to come through his kingdom reign. And it's coming. Jesus is coming. The king is coming. He's bringing his kingdom. He's already established his church. But in the future, there's a day coming. We read about it in Revelation 15. John, the apostle's writing. Imagine this. John walks with Jesus, sees him crucified. He's, he's the only one of the disciples who's there. When Jesus is crucified, he's there. He sees him crucified, and then he sees him resurrected. Years later, John's on an island. He was, he was uh, um, marooned on this island called Patmos. And he's there, and Jesus appears to him and gives him this revelation, which we know is the book of Revelation. He shows him this dream. Chapter 15, John's describing this vision. He says, Then I saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which would bring God's wrath to a completion. I saw before me what seemed to, be, seemed to be a glass sea mixed with fire, and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. Those are the ones that have stayed on the righteous way. Okay, that's the faithful remnant. Those are the people who have chosen to plant by the river in Psalm 1. They were all holding harps that God had given them. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. I want to just, for a pause for a second, when we sing in our church, when we're singing, we're lifting the name of Jesus, of King Jesus. We're giving him praise and glory. We're practicing for this one day when our eternal occupation will be singing to him, as the angels do. You see, when we come here, it's not about a performance. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I appreciate the music team. Jess and Brady and the team have done an incredible job of, of preparing. They, they put in hours and hours of work during the week to be ready to lead us all into an atmosphere, into a climate of worship. 
Now, I'm sure many of you love listening to hear me talk, but how many of you really appreciate some good music and good worship? I, there, there's many of you. And, and I think, I, I, I do. But what that does is it brings us into a place. Music is designed to bring us into a place where we forget about this place for just a little while and we catch a glimpse of what John's talking about. When Jesus will be king, when we're lifting him up, that's what we'll do eternally. And so um, as we sing, we're going to be singing here in a few moments, I want to encourage you, let's put the focus not on, not on the team, certainly not on those people around you, but let's put our focus in our hearts. Let's give our worship to God. Let, let's practice for that one day. How, how many of you have ever been in a, in a children's Christmas program? How many of you have ever had the privilege of, of trying to organize one of those? <laughs> Okay, let, let, let me just unpack something here. When God sees us singing to him, it's like you looking at your kids singing at Christmas. We should be the ones who want to please our Father, not our earthly Father, but our Heavenly Father. See, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but we're like little kids. And when we sing to him, God wants to see us sing like little children. Jesus said, come to heaven as a child. We're supposed to enter his courts with praise like a little child. We're not supposed to sing praises to him like this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Okay? That's not it. I, I, want, I want, as we sing, be reminded that our offering is an all-in thing. It's a beautiful picture Revelation 15, and they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations, who will not fear the Lord and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. What does this kingdom culture look like? What does it look like to be a part of of Jesus' kingdom. We're going to be discovering this over the next couple of weeks as we talk about King Jesus. But I think many of us, like the Jewish people in the first century, were expecting something different than what they got. They were expecting a material, political kingdom when Jesus was bringing a spiritual revolution. I think oftentimes we try to take by force what can only be conquered through love. The kingdom of Jesus is marked by giving, by sacrificing, and by humility. We're not going to win the kingdom or build the kingdom in Washington, D.C. or in Pierre, South Dakota. The hope of our nation is in Jesus Christ, and the hope of the church is not in the White House. I don't care who's in the office, if it's a Republican or Democrat, that hope will never be in the White House. It's going to be in your house. And how you live it out. How you live out Jesus. I want to go back to Zechariah for just a minute because there's another picture here that Zechariah gives us in chapter 14. He says, on that day, he's speaking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus coming, there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between night and day. When the evening comes, there will be light. Verse 8, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the east to the Dead Sea and half to the west to the Mediterranean. In summer and winter, the Lord will be king over all of the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. You see, the king is coming. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was actualized in the New Testament, and, and Jesus is giving us a picture of the future kingdom. But I think our expectations sometimes are different. You see, I think as a church, sometimes we expect a lake kingdom. It, many, many of you go and visit lakes in, in, the, in the summer, and I, and I love lakes. I mean, it's fun, because what, what do you do? You go there, you sit down, and you stare at the lake. Right? And then you get up and you go jump in the lake. 
and then you get back out of the lake. And then you get in your cars and you go back home. You see, a lake is a place for gathering. It's a place for recreation. It's a place where we come and we leave the world for a little bit. And I think too often we think of the church or the kingdom of God as some lake where we can all come and we can all take. And that's what you do at a lake, is you take. You build homes on them. You, you buy boats, you buy jet skis. For what? Recreation and entertainment. And please hear me, I'm not saying that's bad. We actually need that. Okay? God's given us lakes for enjoyment. I'm not making a statement against lakes. But what sort of culture is God's kingdom? Is it a lake kingdom? Or is it a river? Is he creating a, a lake or a river kingdom? I want to just go back to that phrase in Zechariah. On that day, on that day, the kingdom day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. You see, a lake, if you have your notes, you might want to write this in, a lake is defined by its capacity to gather. Lakes are defined by how big they are. We have a set of these in our country called the what? Great Lakes. Because they're great in size. They can gather a lot of water. Rivers are defined by their capacity to send. Rivers are defined by their capacity to give, to pour out. You see, lakes are pretty places and they're beautiful. I love going to lakes. But rivers are powerful. Rivers are powerful. See, Celebrate is a river church. We're not a lake church. Now, now I look out here, and, and you are a beautiful people. You're very pretty. So turn to somebody right now and say, you're pretty, okay? Come on. Go ahead. Tell someone. If it's someone you don't know, it's... But I mean, look, at the, look at the beauty and I'm not saying beauty is a bad thing. God's created you in his image. He's given us things for our enjoyment. I'm not fun-hating. But as a church, we have a mission. We are a river that's going to be flowing out for all eternity. And we need to set up that kind of a mindset in our world. We're defined by not what we can gather, not by our attendance or our offering. We're defined by what we send out. We're defined by what we send out. And so I want to close with these three questions before the team comes. And the first one is this. If we're going to be a sending church, if we are actually a kingdom church that's about sending, there's three questions that each of us must answer for ourselves. As part of the body of Christ, these are questions you need to answer. Who will bring them? Who will I bring? Jesus said this when he was on earth. He said, blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. Are you a messenger of good news? Are you bringing good news to people? I love this passage. It's in the Gospel of John. It's actually the first words that John records from Jesus. In verse 37 of chapter 1, it says this, when the two disciples heard him say this, they heard the word of Christ. So when they heard it, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked. I love this question. What do you want? Maybe, maybe that'd be a good question to ask yourself, to ask your spouse, to ask your friends, to ask your children, what is it that you want? That's what Jesus asked. They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? like like where, where do we go to worship you it's almost like they're asking where do you where are you staying here's what jesus says come and you will see come and you will see so they went and saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him it was about four in the afternoon verse 40 andrew simon peter's brother was one of the two who heard what john had said and had followed jesus the first thing Andrew did, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. 
and he brought him to Jesus. Who are you bringing to Jesus? Now, they might not ever come to church. That's a possibility. But who are you bringing to Jesus? Maybe, the, maybe if you're not, maybe the reason is you haven't heard. Who are you bringing? If we're going to be ascending church, we've got to be bringing church. We've got to be bringing people to Jesus just like Andrew did. Here's the second one. How will they grow? How will I grow? See, I can't make a disciple if I'm not one myself. How will I grow? How will you grow? Let me give you the short answer. God's word. The written word, the spoken word, and then the living word. You see, this church is not about a preacher. It's about a people. And see, for each of us, we need to be in this book. We need to be letting it transform us. We need to have people speaking into our lives. And we need to be around people that can lead us back to this when we get off track. You see, what would happen if we became a church full of people who were full of the word? And it just became how we fought, how we talked, and most importantly, how we lived. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, the Bible is not the light of the world. It's the light of the church. But the world does not, excuse me, for the world does not read the Bible. Would you agree with that? <laughs> the world doesn't pick this up. The world is ignorant of God's wisdom in his word. Spurgeon says this, the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. Think about that. For some people in your life, in your place of work, for some people in your neighborhood, you may be the only Bible they ever get to read. Are they seeing it lived out? How will people grow? How will people mature? How will we make disciples? By getting in the Word. I'm going to invite the team to come. Because the last question is this. If you bring them and they grow, the last question is this, where will they go? Where will they go? It's, it's a, a few months away now. It's maybe, wow, it's about six weeks away. We're going to be having a graduation ceremony here at Brandon and many schools around. Do you know what I find interesting? For the most part, those of you that are in the education world, how, how many seniors, after they graduate, come back to school the next day? <laughs> Would that be kind of weird? Like you have the graduation ceremony, and then all of a sudden, oh, wait, why are you back here? What do you do once you graduate? Once you cross that platform, what's the next step? You go. And I think too many of us have gotten caught in this circular thing of, well, I come to church. I come to church every week. But you never go anywhere. See, the kingdom is about going. Jesus didn't say, stay and make disciples. Even though that's what the disciples did. They stayed in Jerusalem. Guess what happened after 12 years? They started getting persecuted. See, Jesus didn't say, stay and make disciples. He said, go and make disciples. It's interesting to me that the 18 to 24 demographic in Brandon is like 2%. Because <laughs> when they graduate, guess what? It's in their nature. It's in their heart to go. To go. And that's what we're to do as the church. As we grow in maturity, we are to be a people that goes. We're to be a going people. Bringing, growing, and going. Would you join me as we pray? Father, God, God I ask that you would be working in your church. Father, we have your commands, we have your word, and we realize that it's not about us. It's about you. We exist, we are created for your purpose, and for your glory. Father, I pray that as we enter into a time of, of worship and singing, Father, I pray that it wouldn't be about us, but they would be reminded that it is about you your purpose for us, to love you, to love each other, your people, and to make disciples.
people known not for what we take or what we gather, but a people known for what we can give and what we can surrender. We want to be that church. It's my prayer that we'd honor you today, Father, by our song.